Welcome back to the Art of Charm podcast. I'm AJ. And I'm Johnny. Now, this is a show where we bring you actual tips and strategies on how to supercharge your social skills and turn that boring small talk into smart talk, surrounding yourself with an army of high status individuals to grow your social capital. To unlock your hidden charisma to crush it in business, love, and life. Now, not only have we been doing this podcast with great tips and scientifically proven social strategies and amazing guests, we've also been delivering live and online advanced emotional intelligence training programs for over a decade. If what you learned on this show has helped you in your life, imagine what one of our tailored programs could do for you. To learn more about these advanced social skills programs, go to theartofcharm.com for more details and to sign up for our newsletter. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends. Do you feel robotic when you have to present or talk to strangers in social situation? Feel your Zoom meetings are boring and you can't seem to jump in? Feel like you're losing your social skills being stuck in quarantine working from home? Develop the conversation skills to connect with anyone, double your network, and start feeling normal again. You see, we've assembled our best content from the last 15 years for you to supercharge your social skills and come out of this quarantine with the skills that you need to get ahead in a new economy. Head over to theartofcharm.com slash accelerate to learn more. theartofcharm.com slash accelerate. Thank you everyone for joining us and tuning in. Let's kick off the show. Now today, we're talking with none other than Gretchen Rubin. If you are in any form or manner reading about happiness, you're probably already familiar with that name. Gretchen is one of the most influential writers on happiness and human nature, and her books are regularly on the New York Times bestseller list, including The Happiness Project, Better Than Before, and The Four Tendencies, which we're going to be talking about today. She also hosts a high-ranking podcast, Happier with Gretchen Rubin, together with her sister, and we're so happy to have her join the show to help us in these difficult times find happiness and understand ourselves at a deeper level. Welcome to the show, Gretchen. It's so great to have you. We've thoroughly enjoyed all of your books, and we're going to be talking a lot about the four tendencies today, but it really is an honor to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, when it comes to happiness, I know we've talked a lot about it on the show, but what originally drew you to studying human nature and happiness and writing about it? Well, you know, it was a very inconspicuous moment of my life. I was on a crowded city bus in the pouring rain and I was staring out the window and I thought, what do I want from life anyway? And I thought, well, I want to be happy. And I realized in that moment, I never thought about, was I happy? Could I be happier? Can you make yourself happier? Um, I just never gave it any thought. So I ran out to the library the next day, as I always do, and got out a giant stack of books about happiness. And started researching it. And as I read more and more, I just got more and more excited about, I want to try this, I want to try that. Um, and at first it was just a project for me. It was just something I wanted to do for my own benefit. Uh, but I soon realized that it was such a kind of inexhaustibly fascinating subject that I wanted to write a book about it. And in fact, I've been writing about it uh, for the last 10 years because it turns out it's a very interesting subject. Gretchen, I know for myself that the the day that I realized that happiness was a choice was the day that I started making large changes and small changes in my life because it was the first time that I ever realized that it was I had control over that. And for a lot of us, do you do you feel that there are certain things that push us in that direction to begin asking that question, or is it something that we all naturally just come upon at some point through life. What has your research led you to believe on that idea? Well, it's interesting because you said that happiness is a choice because so many people have told me that and it's clearly like such a profound realization. I have to say for me, it's like that's sort of a confusing idea. I feel like I can't choose to be happy. And so I focus much more on the things that I think, the concrete th uh, actions that I think would make me happier. Like I think I would be happier if I got more sleep. I think I would be happier if I saw my friends more. I think I would be happy if I spent more time reading. So I think much more about like, well, what would the consequences of an action be? Because I feel like for me, I can't go straight into my head. Like every time I think about like, what's my emotional state right now, I sort of like get lost in a fog. You know, one of the things that they're saying in happiness research, research is like, rate yourself on a one to 10 scale. And the minute somebody says that, it's like me paying attention to my breath and meditation. I'm like, I begin, I begin suffocating the minute I think about it. Um, so I think much more about 
well, what are the concrete things that I think would lead me in the right direction? But so I think each of us sort of needs to approach it with our own metaphors, our own vocabulary. Uh, I think we often get to the same place, but we might take different roads there just because we think about things in a different way. Um, often people will talk about happiness as a journey. Again, that's a, not a metaphor that has a lot of, uh, doesn't really strike a chord with me, but for many people, it's a very powerful metaphor. I talked about a happiness project. Um, and for me, I love that. I, I love the idea of a project, but for many people, they're like, that sounds like homework. That's no fun. Like you can't call your book the happiness project. Nobody will want that. So again, it's like, that's the metaphor that works for me. Um, so I think it's fantastic for everyone to kind of think through, well, what's the right metaphor for me to use? And I think many of us, when we think about happiness, it's easy for us to look at our past and immediately picture those moments. But often when we're actually feeling happy in the moment or projecting it out into the future, it's a lot more difficult. And it could feel like a dog almost chasing its tail. Like, how do I pinpoint what it is that truly makes me happy? And right now, we're obviously going through a lot of uncertainty. And of course, that's going to lead to some thoughts of unhappiness and frustration. So what are you suggesting a lot of our listeners do right now with all the uncertainty that we're feeling about our future? I think happiness in the future for a lot of us is just something we're not even thinking about. Right. Because there's, as you say, there's so much uncertainty. And one of the things that's very tied to happiness is a sense of control. And people who have a sense of control of their lives tend to feel much happier if it's control over their time, control over how they do their work. Uh, and, and the sense now where people are like, it's just, it's not knowable. It's like nobody knows. And so um, I think one thing that's helpful is to think about, well, what, what can I control? What do I know? And I can't control the pandemic, but I can control my email inbox or I can, and I think this is one of the reasons why you see so many people doing clutter clearing. Um, because I think um, for most people, outer order contributes to inner calm um, to sort of a surprising degree. And I think that getting control over our physical surroundings helps us to feel kind of more um, in control of ourselves, which is obviously an illusion, but it's a helpful illusion. And so I think many people are trying to kind of quiet the noise in their environment to quiet the noise in their head. Um, and I think w one um, thing that I tried doing um, is to create a flow chart to manage uncertainty because sometimes, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where there's all these possibilities, they're all swirling around your head, one thing leads to another thing, but then there's this other thing, and then there's this other thing you don't know, but then what if this thing happens and it all just kind of spirals out of control? So I made a flow chart of like, well, if the summer looks like this, then we could do A or B. If the summer looks like that, we could do A, B, or C. If the summer looks like this, then we could do A or B. And just writing it down on paper gave me a sense of control and that it allowed me to kind of externalize my thoughts and possibilities. And so it didn't feel like this kind of infinite, overwhelming number of choices. It gave me sort of a sense of control and kind of that comfort of making a list and sort of seeing, well, you know, in another month, we'll probably know whether, you know, of A, B, and C, we probably will know if A is going to happen. Maybe it won't, but we'll know more in a month. Um, and it's just hard, you know, it's hard for all of us. And to just also is to acknowledge how you're really feeling and not pretend like, how can I be worried about my summer when, you know, the entire country is falling into a recession? It's like, both things can be true. You can be worried about yourself and you can be worried about the country both things can be true. You don't have to minimize your own experience in order to uh, recognize the gravity of what others are going through. And as an obliger, I find myself now confronting dealing with other people's unhappiness and trying to, to help them find happiness. And a lot of us now being cooped up with family members, spouses, significant others for more time, we're really struggling not only to find our own happiness, but to support those around us who yes. are unhappy. Well, there is something called emotional contagion. That's what they call it. We literally infect each other with emotions. And like you say, like if you're under the same roof with somebody, you're going to pick up those emotions. Even on something like a Zoom call, a phone call, looking at a photograph, we start picking up that emotional information for, from each other because it's such important information for us to have. So we definitely do uh, influence each other. And I think it is hard um, when you feel like you have to sort of support the whole household or create a sense of energy for the household or kind of be the buffer or the shock absorber or always the one to look on the bright side or to make a joke. Um, that is really important work. I mean, I think, I think that people should get more credit for that. I, there's, um, a prayer, um, that I read where it says it's like, you know, 
protect the six, help the weary. And it says shield your joyous ones. And I love that because I think the people that are really concerned at keeping other people's spirits high, it's like, that's really hard work. So gold star, if you're the one doing it, but it is very emotionally draining. Um, and so I think if you're like that, you need to try to think of like, well, what are the healthy treats I could give myself? Or do I have enough solitude to kind of get a sense of, uh, you know, re regeneration? Um, am I reading a novel? Am I, you know, doing whatever it is, going for a run, whatever it is to help me keep myself feeling calm and energetic and focused? Um, it's the old cliche about putting on your own oxygen mask first. If you burn yourself out, it's like, that's not going to be good for anybody. Um, but when you're dealing with a lot of people, sometimes it can be hard to say, hey, guys, I got to go. Um, I'm going to go take a, you know, sit in the bathroom with the door locked for half an hour and just nobody bang on the door. <laughs> well, I think for a lot of us, uh, we're used to saying, hey, I got to run, but yeah. now we don't have anywhere to run to. No, you got to come up with a whole new bunch of excuses. Yes. Yeah. Now you mentioned cliches and I think of happiness as having a lot of cliches and, and myths around what we believe uh, and certainly trying to attain happiness. Yeah. In your research, what was sort of the most shocking or uh, unusual finding that you didn't really think going in would be important in our happiness? Well, I don't know if this is a myth, but it's definitely something that surprised me, which is if you look at the happiness research, it says that, um, Novelty and challenge make people happier. That doing something new, even something like going to eat at a new restaurant in the, even in ordinary times, or you know, that just little new things tend to make people happier. And I thought, well, that's maybe what the research shows, but that's not true for me. I love familiarity and mastery. I I eat the same food all the time. I stay in my neighborhood a lot. Like I like to read and write, and that's basically it. I, I don't have a lot of interest. So that's not true for me. But then because of my project, the nature of my project, using myself as a guinea pig. I tried doing new things. And what I found out is that it's absolutely true. And I was 100% wrong. The research is absolutely correct that novelty and challenge make people happier. And again, looking at the pandemic, I think one of the things people are doing is like, I've never baked bread before. Now is the time. Or, you know, people, I want to get a guitar and teach myself to play guitar. I think people are seeking to create that feeling of growth. Um, that a sense of like, I can't go outside and have new experiences. I can't travel. And maybe I can go somewhere new in my head. Uh, maybe I can push myself to learn French and get back into French or whatever it is um, and get, make myself feel that sense of happiness and growth, um, you know, without leaving my house. It's funny that you mentioned the two things that I've been seeing a lot of people post the most of their bread creating and their guitar playing. Yeah, there you is, go. It's, it's like, seems, it's the same impulse. It's, it's there. And then of course, with the, joyousness of those people reaching out and learning and and going to new places and making things novel in their life you know social media is also showing us the absolute other side of that the ugly the negativity the everything that comes with with all of of that and it's i'm certainly one who has been trying to navigate that, knowing how easily I'm influenced by those around me and the stimulus that I, I consume. So it's certainly uh, a difficult time for everybody to, to keep focus on what is going to make them happy. Any suggestions there for, for people who are now coming to, to this idea that they have a little bit more control over it than they might think? Well, I think you're exactly right. And I think um, a lot of times, um, like looking at, uh, let, let's just think of technology. Um, it's really helpful to think of like, is this making me happier or is this not making me happier? Is this thing serving me well? Um, because something like technology is a wonderful servant, but a bad master. And you could say, you can acknowledge, it's great to keep up with everybody on Facebook. It's great to use Zoom, but I realize that I'm spending three hours scrolling through uh, you know, my news updates is, and Twitter, and it's really bringing me down. And so to say, okay, well, how can I get control of that? So there's a lot of different things you can do. You can turn off notifications. You can limit yourself to just sort of checking things twice a day. My husband wakes up low. Like I wake up high, I'm a morning person and kind of drift down over the day. My husband wakes up low and he realized that he just shouldn't check the news before noon. He just wanted to start his day, kind of get, get on his, you know, get everything going. And then once he was underway, then he would check the news. And, that, and so he had to sort of learn that about his own mental function. Um, and I think for a lot of us, it's, it's thinking, okay, how can I change this, this experience so that I get the most out of it? Um, you do not need to be updated every half an hour. You know, it's like nothing's happening. 
that you need to know within a half an hour, or if it is, you will know um, through some other way than checking Twitter. Um, there's funny things you could do. One thing you could do if you have a smartphone is uh, you can change your phone to grayscale so that instead of appearing in color, it's in black, white, and gray. And oh boy, it's like watching your grandpa's black and white <laughs> TV set. It's not nearly as much fun to play with your phone when it's in black, white, and gray. Um, so I think uh, I think part of it is is figuring out um, what are the things that I could do? Do I need to like get up and, and take my dog for a long walk in the morning to get myself kind of started with like some sunshine in my face, a little physical exercise? Is that a time when I really concentrate? So I want to really get my, like my serious work out of the day before my household wakes up. So I need to like really hold that time very precious for work. And so I'm not going to check the news so that I can focus or I need to wake up slow. So I, my, like my sister, she, she wakes up with a coffee, cup of coffee and CNN every morning. And that's, she just loves to start her day that way. Part of it is just really tuning into our own mental state and creating the circumstances that allow us to be as happy and creative as, and healthy as we can be, uh, given these very unusual circumstances that we find ourselves in. I think a lot of us right now are spending more time alone with our thoughts. And we talk a lot on this show about in order to become better at building relationships, you have to raise your own self-awareness and yes. understand yourself at a deeper level. And many of us, this is the first time we're really confronting some of those thoughts and emotions about ourselves. And your book, The Four Tendencies, it really outlines these exact things, these tendencies that we have. How did that come about for you? How did you raise your own self-awareness? And, and following up on that, how can we use this time to raise our self-awareness? Uh, well, I got my insight into the Four Tendencies framework um, when a friend said something very very kind of typical to me. You know, I've heard many people say something. I've heard, I'm sure people have said this themselves or heard people say it. She said to me, I was, I am kind of a happiness bully. And so if I think there's a way for you to be happier, I can kind of get up in your face about it. So I was asking her about her happiness habits. And she said to me, well, you know, the funny thing about me is I know I'd be happier if I exercised. And when I was in high school, I was on the track team and I never missed track practice. So why can't I go running on my own now? And I thought, well, why? It's the same person. It's the same behavior. At one time it was effortless. Now she can't do it. How do you explain that? And then I, then I noticed other patterns that I couldn't really understand. Like I would ask people, how do you feel about New Year's resolutions? Because I was writing my book better than before. That was all about habit formation. And so I was very interested in New Year's resolutions. And a group of people would say exactly the same thing. They would say, I will keep a resolution whenever it makes sense to me but I would not do it on January 1st because January 1st is an arbitrary date. And they would always say that. I thought, that's funny because the arbitrariness of January 1st never really bothered me. So actually I was thinking about these and other patterns of behavior and trying to understand were they related to each other? How did they, how did they fit together? What did they explain about kind of certain anomalies I was seeing and how people met, you know, kept habits and then finally, I, I stumbled into understanding that the key idea was this idea of expectations, outer and inner expectations, and that's what's led me to the Four Tendencies framework. Your discovery of your own tendencies, what was that journey like? I feel like it's a lot easier to see it in others. It's often difficult for us to see it in ourselves. And when my fiance, Amy, read the book, she put it down immediately and was like, you're an obliger. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And what and, is she? And she's an upholder. So a perfect example of what drives her crazy is the seven half open mustard jars in our fridge, because I have every flavor of mustard imaginable for all the different dishes that I'm cooking through quarantine. And it drives her crazy that I can't just finish one before opening the next. Why do we need seven? And I feel for a lot of us, recognizing these patterns in others, a lot easier than dealing with ourselves. Yeah, well, maybe I should go through all four so we can really get into it. Um, I love knowing that you're an obliger. Okay. So the four tendencies divides people into upholders, questioners, obligers, and rebels. And what this looks at is how you respond to expectations. And we all face two kinds of expectations, outer expectations like a work deadline or request from a friend, and inner expectations like my own desire to keep a New Year's resolution, my own desire to get back into meditation. So depending on how you respond to outer and inner expectations, that's what makes you an upholder, a questioner, obliger, rebel. Now, most people, I will describe them now, and most people know what they are right away. They know what the people in their lives are. They could do the Game of Thrones people. I could do Game of Thrones. It's, these are very obvious once you hear them. But there is a quiz, um, quiz.gretchenrubin.com, if people just want to be told the answer. It's a very simple, quick, free quiz. 
Um, so upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. They meet the work deadline. They keep the New Year's resolution without much fuss. They want to know what other people expect from them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. So their motto is discipline is my freedom. Then there are questioners. Questioners question all expectations. They'll do something if, if they think it makes sense. So they resist anything inefficient, arbitrary, uh, unjustified. Um, if something meets their inner standard, they will do it no problem. If it fails their inner standard, they will push back. Um, so their motto is, I will comply if you convince me why. Then there are obligers like you. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. Um, so that explains my friend on the track team. When a team and a coach were expecting her to show up, she had no trouble showing up. When she was trying to go on her own, it was a challenge. And so what obligers need to keep in mind is they're great at meeting outer expectations. If they want to keep inner expectations, they have to create a form of outer accountability. If you want to read more, join a book group. If you want to exercise more, work out with a trainer, work out with a friend who's going to be annoyed if you don't show up. Think of your duty to your future self. Um, take your dog for a run who's going to be so disappointed if he doesn't get to go for a run and he'll tear up the furniture, raise money for a charity because you're going to do a charity run. You just need that outer accountability to follow through. So the motto of the obliger is, you can count on me, and I'm counting on you to count on me. And then finally, rebels. Rebels resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. They want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. They can do anything they want to do. They can do anything they choose to do. But if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. And typically, they don't like to tell themselves what to do. Like They don't sign up for like a 10 a.m. webinar on screenwriting on Saturday morning because they think, I don't know what I what I'm gonna want to do on Saturday morning. And just the idea that I'm supposed to show up someplace at some time annoys me. Um, so their motto is, you can't make me and neither can I. Um, your tendency, the obliger tendency is the biggest tendency for both men and women. We all either are obligers or we have many obligers in our lives. They are the type O, they pair up the most easily with the other tendencies. There's a lot of obligers in the world. Now, Listening to that, and I know our audience is very analytical, a lot of us may hear a bit of ourselves in a couple of those tendencies. Is that normal? If you feel very strongly that you are a mix of all of them, then you are probably a questioner. Because what questioners say to me is, well, I do whatever makes sense in the situation. If I respect you, I'll do what you say. Like, So I act like an upholder. If I think you're an idiot, I'm going to refuse to do what you say. Because like, why am I going to follow some idiot? I'm like, yeah, you're acting like a questioner because your question is, why should I? That's questioner. Questioners are also like, well, everybody should act like a questioner because that's what makes the most sense. And I'm like, but they don't, which I'm sure you've noticed as a questioner that people don't act that way all the time. Now, of course, all of us have a little bit of, every, you know, all of these. All of us will defer to someone else's needs if it's really important. All of us don't want to do something that's totally arbitrary or stupid. All of us are a little bit rebel in that we want to be autonomous. We want to be self-directed. It's really, it's, it's, so we each have a little bit of this, but for most people, there really is a, a dominant tendency that really does explain a lot of the patterns of their behavior. For instance, the questioners, questioners are often told, you ask too many questions. If you get that, you're probably a questioner. Um, you know, rebels, if, if you say to somebody, why don't you ever do anything I ask you to do? You're probably dealing with a rebel, you know, so there are ways to tell. <laughs> you know, to, to go along with that, when I, First got the book, I, w I looked at all of the dis descriptions and I, for just, just on a surface level, I thought I was the rebel and I was, this was going to be a no brainer. And I just, I just thought about just how I go about clothes and music and, and a lot of things. But of course, as reading, I was like, oh, well, I'm, I, I am the questioner through and through. Um, and it's, it's uh, as a questioner, my thoughts of, well, this is just going to be whatever you want to be during that day when you feel like it and how you answer the questions. And it's, you can even look at this as something of astrology where she writes some nice things and some weaknesses about each one and you could sort of gravitate. And, and the more I wanted to prove that, the more I was proven wrong that, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I and I just even the questions as I'm reading it, the questions that you were proposing as I was reading the book, I those were already in my head, and I was angry that you had it dialed in 
<laughs> so well. Oh, that's um, wonderful to hear. Uh, so anything that you could say in your in your research to to that you had found that really separates these I was for me it was I I was so marveled at how such a on a surface level a simple idea could be uh so well put together and so and so separate. Well, thank you very much. I have to say the whole time that I was writing the pretendencies, I'm like, I cannot be the first person who's noticed this because once you point it out, it's very, very obvious. And it's like, and one person is not the other. It's like, they really, yeah. they're, they're very distinct. And um, it really explains a lot of things that had always kind of made me curious. For instance, if you study the big five personality um, descriptions, one of them is conscientiousness. Now, this has always puzzled me when I think about the people that I know, because I'm an upholder which means I readily meet outer and inner expectations. So I score very high on conscientiousness, which is not surprising. But what puzzled me about the world is that there were many people who to me looked half conscientious. They looked split conscientious. They would never be late to pick up their kid for carpool, but they couldn't go running on their own or they couldn't like, you know, stick to a diet. And yet they would never, you know, like they couldn't make themselves go to the doctor. And yet they would never have like let down a patient if they were the doctor. So I was like, it's funny because they seem 100 percent conscientious in one way, but then like 10 percent conscious is the other way. And that didn't make sense to me as someone who's highly conscientious. And, and then also when I was writing my book better than before, I was I was very excited about writing a book about habits. I just thought this was the most delicious, fascinating subject of all time. I was at a dinner party and I met this woman who now is she was actually one of my like. Uh, OG rebels, because at the time I, I didn't even know what a rebel was, but this conversation with her like opened my eyes. And when I just told her I was writing a book about um, habits, she literally took a step back for me, like in revulsion. She was like, why would you want to write a book about such a, like an awful subject? That's just like, who wants to think about habits? Because she was a rebel who really, really didn't like the idea of like constraining herself. Um, some rebels love habits, but then often rebels will resist them. And so I thought, well, that's interesting because we're having such different reactions to this idea. And so it really was just my observation, me trying to make sense of things that seemed very obvious in the world, and yet I couldn't figure out how to explain them. Um, a lot of times when you read about like habit strategies, they'll say, well, this works really, really well. This is like the 100% way to do it. This is the best way to do it. This is the right way to do it. Now, a good 40% of the people, this doesn't work for them. And I'm like, well, Okay, but then then you haven't answered the question, which is how does a person change a habit? You can't just be like, well, my way is the right way. And if it doesn't work for you, then there's something wrong with you. I'm like, well, what about all the other people? Um, so I was really struggling to try to account for pe how people responded differently. And it took me so long to get to this idea of expectations, but then that's when it all sort of cracked open. And, and I remember when I was laying it out, it was hard for me. If you, in my mind, it's a Venn diagram with four overlocking locking circles. It took me a long time. I kept trying to do a two by two. It doesn't work as a two by two. And I remember when I did it and it was like, you know, it was like a fern frond or like, a, you know, one of these, the, 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 the periodic table of the elements. It was just, the, the, it was so perfect and elegant the way nature is. Like everything was accounted for. All of a sudden, all these sort of disparate things all of a sudden locked into place. And oh my gosh, it was just the most euphoric intellectual moment of my life was when I finally grasped how all these things fit together. It almost melted my brain. Um, but it was, it, it made me happy when I finally figured it out. So you completed the happiness project by figuring out the four tendencies. Yes. Yes. It made <laughs> me very happy. Yeah. Now, why do you think it's important for us to understand our own tendency? Well, I think when you understand your own tendency, then you don't waste time throwing spaghetti against the wall. Like you're an obliger. Obligers need outer accountability. That's what works for them. It, like if they have outer accountability, they just they can just do they can cross anything off their list. But a lot of times, obligers beat themselves up and they say, "I don't understand it." Like my husband could just like get up and go for a run every morning. I should be able to do that. What's wrong with me? And they beat themselves up and they say things like, "I'm lazy. I have no." Will, willpower. I have no self-control. I should, I, why well, I, I need to take more time for self-care. I need to look, make myself the priority. I need to learn to put myself first. And I'm just here to say that doesn't work. I'm not saying it's not a good idea. I'm just saying that doesn't result in change. If, 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 if in fact you say, if you're like, instead of trying to go for a run, say that you're going to meet a friend and go for a run or like text a friend and say, I'm going now. Are you going? Your friend's like in Austin, Texas, I'm in New York city. And if she's like, yeah, I'm, yes, I'm going. Are you going? 
And I'm like, okay, I have to go because if I don't go, she doesn't have to go. And I know she really wants to stick to it. Um, funnily enough, obligers even often need outer accountability, even for things that are fun um, to, like you said, you know, what if you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself to sort of hold up everybody else or uh, so sometimes obligers feel sort of burnt out and resentful for that. Well, they need outer accountability, even for something like I'm going to sit on the sofa and read for three hours. Well, I knew two sisters-in-law and they both, they both really wanted to get into yoga. They knew that would make them happy, but they were having a lot of trouble doing it. So they made a deal. So if I did 30 days straight of yoga, my sister-in-law gets a massage. If she does 30 days straight of yoga, I get a massage. So I can blow off the massage, the yoga if I want, but it's my sister-in-law who's going to pay the price. So both of them were perfect because they used outer accountability in order to do something that they wanted to do for themselves, which was to do yoga. Um, so, you know, once you real, or like if you're, um, let's say, uh, you're a rebel and you sometimes rebels will say to me, how come I can't stick to a schedule? You know, people tell me, oh, sign up for a class. And then I do, and I go one time and then I never go back. Why am I not a real grown up? And I'm like, because rebels don't do well with schedules. They don't like to, they don't like to schedule themselves. They don't like things on their calendar. They don't like to do lists. You could make a could do list. You could make a might could list. You could put slips of paper in a jar with things that you might want to do. And you and like every once in a while, you pull something out of the jar and you do it if you feel like it. That works for rebels. There's all kinds of workarounds for rebels. Once you realize there's not that there's anything wrong with me, it's just that this approach doesn't suit my tendency. Let me try an approach that's more compatible with my tendency. And I might find that I'm, I have a much easier time sticking to whatever it is that I want is my aim for myself. And certainly... To, to be happier, to have that, that understanding of what is going to allow you to reach the goals that you've outlined for yourself is, 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 is going to be a large part of your happiness. And to be able to see how somebody does it and then get frustrated to not think, well, I'm not less than this person. This has been my friend for years. How are the, is it so easy for them? What I was, I laughed about so hard on for the weaknesses of the questioner, which was, uh, it was crackpot, and um, the other one was analysis paralysis. Analysis paralysis. I I'm 46, so in understanding myself so well, I've already created special rules for those two problem areas. <laughs> like what? Okay, so so for analysis to paralysis. I, there, I have a rule that if there's no clear defined right answer, then the answer that I choose will be the right one. I will put all of my efforts into making that the correct answer. So there may not be right or wrong decisions, only decisions you make right. So that is my rule for that one. That gets me through analysis paralysis. And for crackpot, it is, I need to, can I use this information in a court of law and not be laughed out of the room? Or can I write a peer reviewed paper on this and not be laughed out? So those are, and I've known this about myself and I learned this uh, late twenties, early thirties. So those rules were installed for those two problem areas that I had found in my life. And they're so pronounced that AJ knows these rules because I, I state them all the time. <laughs> well, that's so, but see, and I think this is a great example of uh, a question that people often say, which is, well, which tendency is the happiest tendency or which tendency is the most successful tendency or the most productive tendency? And what it is, it's not that any one tendency is the happiest or the most productive or the healthiest or the most creative or whatever. It's the people who have figured out themselves and have figured out how do I solve my particular limitations, exactly. my particular weaknesses. And it's like if you're an obliger, like a lot of times obligers without realizing it will create all kinds of outer accountability because they know they're like, I'll do much better if I take a class. Why don't I sign up for a class? Or like you knew that you tended to fall into analysis paralysis and, and, and have trouble making decisions. Let me come up with a heuristic that's going to allow me to make decisions in an efficient but rational way. That's a rational way to solve that problem. And so and once you figured it out, well, then you're fine. And so I think those are the people like with age and wisdom, they're the ones who, you know, they figure out um, what it is that, that, you know, or like a rebel, it's like, maybe you're in a job that doesn't suit your rebel tendency. So you've got yourself, now you got a job in sales and your boss is like, look, anything you need to do to make a sale, well, that's okay. And you're like, okay, I can handle that situation. 
and off you go. And so your rebel tendency then is working for you instead of working against you because you, with wisdom, you, you got yourself to a place, um, where your tendency, uh, was like harnessed, uh, for you instead of against you. So I think you're a great example of somebody intuitively figuring out how to, how to fix the issues that come up. Um, even without consciously understanding the labels. Well, that's what's so great about your book. There, it's laid out in plain night and day. And so everyone has an opportunity to test those ideas and test those theories for their own happiness. I mean, it, it's it's great. I, I just, as I said, I just made me laugh that they were outlined. And I was like, oh my God, those are my two rules. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Now, have you noticed that certain tendencies tend to pair up when it comes to relationships or forming teams? When there is a rebel, um, whether in like a founding work team or in romance, if one person is a rebel, almost always the other person is an obliger. Um, that is a very, very dominant uh, pattern. Um, obliger, is, as I mentioned earlier, is the tendency that tends to pair up the most easily with the other three. Um, but other than that, it's just very, there's so many, uh, qualities that make people team up well or fall in love or whatever. Um, the tendencies can work a ten, uh, but a pairing that typically does not work well is, uh, upholder and rebel because they just want to work in a different way. They have different values. It's just, it's hard for them to get on the same page and stay there because they just, their preferences, they're both kind of extreme personality types. And um, yeah, they tend not to mesh well. It's a particularly problem with parents and children. If you have an upholder or a rebel parent and then upholder or rebel child, uh, that can be tricky, especially if people don't know about the tendency. So they kind of don't understand where that other tendency is coming from. One that a question that I had for this is, uh, have you seen a tendency for, for, the tendencies to marvel or find a, a different tendency so noble like for myself i always marvel at upholders because how are they so able to set themselves in motion so easily when i have to do all this work in order to make this happen well it it, it is funny how uh the different tendencies are sort of like what's up with those other tendencies and a lot of times <laughs> It's nice that you admire uh, another tendency because I have to say often it takes the form of like frustration or like, you know, eye rolling um, because questioners are like, why are all you people just going along with this like lemmings? Like, this is not satisfactory. We don't know why we're supposed, why are we listening to this person at all? Why are we doing this this month? You know, so they think other people are not thorough enough and are doing things for no good reason. Upholders are just annoyed that other people just like can't like sit down and get stuff done. Yeah. Uh, Obligers, obligers often are very puzzled why um, others don't appreciate the weight of expectations that they experience. And this can lead to something in obligers called obliger rebellion. And this is when an obliger meets, 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 meets uh, expectations and then suddenly snaps and says, this I will not do. And sometimes it's their obliger rebellion is kind of funny. Like I'm going to sit in my car and be deliberately wait, late for work, which a lot of obligers do. Or it can be like, I'm going to end a 30 year friendship. I'm going to, I woke up this morning and I decided I'm going to divorce you. I'm going to, I've had it with you people at this office. I'm walking out the door today. Today is my last day. You're dead to me. And obliger rebellion happens when obligers feel ignored or taken advantage of or exploited or unheard. And it's meant to blow up a situation that has become kind of um, unsustainably. Like they just feel so, like, like a suffocating weight of expectation. So it sort of blows things up. So it's meant to be beneficial, but obliger rebellion can, can cause reputational risk because of the, the frustration and the puzzlement of the other tendencies. Because you say to me, well, I'm quitting because all I, you, I'm the only one in here who does anything. I'm on 10 committees and everybody else is only on two committees. And I say to you, I'm your boss. And I asked you if you wanted to be on that committee. And you said, yes, I don't understand why you're so angry. So to the obliger, it's quite obvious. How could you expect me to do that? But to the other tendencies, it's like, well, why didn't you say it was too much? And so that disconnect can cause a lot of um, friction. And so I think, the thing about obliger rebellion is we want to watch out if you're an obliger yourself or you're dealing with obligers, which all of us are, because it's such a big tendency, 
Um, for Look out for those signs of building anger, building resentment, the sense that things aren't fair. We should look out to make sure that things aren't, are fair. Why is one person doing all the unpleasant work travel? Why is one person taking all the night shifts? Why is one person on 10 committees? You know, if you're a manager, if you're a coworker, if you're a friend, um, a family member, you should help somebody say, you know, this is too much. This isn't right. Um, this, this needs to be fixed. Because once a blighter happens, I've talked to so many blighters about this. Once a blighter rebellion starts, it runs its course. You can't stop it once it starts. And sometimes it can be quite, quite dramatic. Um, but as I say, the other tendencies are often not sympathetic. Um, and so that's a problem. And obviously in conflict, uh, an important part is trying to come to a resolution, especially with a spouse or a team member. And I'm assuming rebellion is not a good thing. Are there other negative patterns that tendencies, uh, these other tendencies show that we need to be aware of? Well, yeah. Sometimes questioners will just quietly not do something. They're like, well, eh, I don't, you know, you're saying everybody in the company has to switch to this new software, but yeah, I'm just not going to do that. It doesn't make sense to me. So there's just sort of like quiet refusal that can be, that can be very hard to manage. Um, obligers often, they like, they're so busy meeting expectations that sometimes they just allow things to drop, um, in a way that's not, it's not like prioritized. It's not like I'm going to do the 10 most important things. It's almost kind of seems kind of scattershot from the outside. You have to watch out for that. Rebels, if you're dealing with a rebel, you always want to emphasize, this is your choice. This is what you want. This is the kind of person you are. And when I deal with rebels, because of course, I'm always trying to figure out the tendency of everybody I work with. I'm always like, hey, if this sounds fun to you, it sounds like something that would work for you and would be the kind of thing that would help your platform. It would be great if you would think about doing this, if you think it's fun, if you feel like it, whenever you feel like it, if you feel like it if it works for you, because I want to emphasize, like, I'm not telling you what to, so Rebel told me that somebody sent her an email and in the subject line, it said, please read immediately. So she deleted it without opening it. She's like, yeah, you're not going to tell me to read something right away. Yeah. You know? Um, and so, uh, you know, but each of the tendencies has so many strengths. We all have so much to learn from each other and, and we bring so much um, to the table and we really complement each other. And so, I think it's something that we all want to be aware of is you want to make sure that you're not surrounding yourself with people of your tendency just because you sort of get it. Because of course, like if you get a whole team of upholders, you're going to have almost no flexibility, <laughs> right? Because they're all going to be so just like, well, we just have to execute on a plan. If you have all questioners, it's like, okay, you know, somebody needs, you just, you need a little bit of everything. Um, and, uh, but if you, and, and you need to have compassion for what other people, um, how they might see the world and, and, and kind of the kind of things that might trip them up. And where do you think these tendencies come from and how flexible are they? You know, I'm a big believer in the genetic roots of personality. And I do believe that these are hardwired. I think you bring them into the world with you. Uh, for many children, their tendency is clear, you know, at like age three or four. Um, and uh, I do, as we talked about, I think with time and experience, people learn how to manage their tendencies, but I don't think you're one at 20 and one at 40. I don't think you're one at work and one at home. I think if you think that it's probably because like maybe people will say to me something like, well, I'm an upholder at work, but I'm an obliger at home. And I'm like, well, it's probably that you're an upholder at work because you have deadlines and supervision and a boss and a team. And then at home, well, one of the things I should say about obligers is often sweethearts and spouses don't count as outer expectations or outer accountability for a very romantic reason. It's like, I'm going to ignore you just like I would ignore me. And so, okay, I feel completely capable of not doing what my husband asked me to do or, I, or not doing the things for myself when he's holding me accountable because he counts as inner, inner accountability. Um, so I look like I'm switching between upholder and obliger, but it's really just the different circumstances um, have kind of elicited a different response for me. Um, now, it is also true that if, like, if you looked at a Venn diagram of the four tendencies, you'd see that each tendency overlaps with two tendencies. So like an obliger, you're an obliger. So obligers and, and I'm an upholder. So we have in common that we, we both readily meet outer expectations because that's part of our definition. But obliger also uh, overlaps with rebel because they both resist inner expectations. So an obliger can lean to upholder or they can lean to rebel. And so that's going to change kind of the flavor of your tendency. Um, so even people who are solidly within a tendency might be more or less uh, kind of leaning towards another tendency that overlaps with their own. And 
How can we, outside of giving our spouse, our friends, our coworkers your quiz to take, how yeah. can we start observing these tendencies in others to unlock better communication and harmony? Yeah. If you're trying to, people are always like, how do, if, if somebody won't take the quiz or I can't make them take the quiz, like, how can I tell what they are? Um, well, here are some clues. And again, it's it's not what somebody says, it's how they answer. So here are some things to work, work out, watch out for. If you find yourself saying to somebody, you ask too many questions or they get that a lot, that is a sign of questioner. If somebody talks about self-care, if they talk about make, putting, making themselves a priority, the need to learn to put themselves first or other people say to them, like, you're a doctor, you give 110% to your patients, you need to like find time to do your own exercise or like you say you can't eat health, healthy because you're, you're working 110% for your boss. Okay, that's obliger. That's a sign of obliger. I'm meeting all outer expectations. There's nothing for me. Rebel is you won't do anything I ask you to do. I ask you to do something, you do the opposite. I know you want to do this anyway, but I remind you to do it, then you don't do it. That's a rebel. And I don't want to make it sound like rebels are, can't be successful or they can't be thoughtful, considerate, upstanding, highly altruistic, high-minded people. They absolutely can because that's who they choose to be and that's what they choose to do. They're doing it because that's their identity, that's their choice. Um, you can tell in a polder because... Um, they're the ones that are just like from the time they were in like third grade, they fed the fish without anybody reminding them, you know, they, they just are very kind of like uh, self, self-executing, I think, as an upholder. Now, but, but a lot of the times it's hard to tell between two. Like sometimes it's hard to tell between a questioner and an upholder or a questioner and a rebel. So if you're trying to decide, say, between let's say you have a kid who won't do his homework and you're like, well, is this kid a questioner or a rebel? If the kid is saying why should I do this dumb book report? This doesn't make any sense. This isn't teaching me anything. They're saying, why should I? That's questioner. If the rebel is saying, my teacher says she can make me. She can't make me. How is she going to make me do this book report? I don't want to do it. I'm not doing it. That's, you can't make me. That's rebel. Um, or or uh, if to oblige her, if you feel like the person's going to follow through, if they know that you're watching, um, but maybe not if you're not watching. And when it comes to traits like perfectionism, procrastination, imposter syndrome, do you find that certain tendencies line up with these or can you find them in all of these tendencies? What's well, interesting about the tendencies because they describe a very narrow aspect of your personality. It's a significant aspect, but it doesn't like you could have 50 obligers and they would all be very different on how analytical they were, how curious they were, how adventurous, adventurous they were, how extroverted they were. All these things would be different. And really something like perfectionism is about anxiety and impulsivity, and, or, or not impulsivity, uh, and, and uh, procrastination is about impulsivity. So it's really like, how are you dealing with those other things? So if you're a perfectionist, it means that you're very anxious about whether something is going to be good enough. Um, so you could be any of the tendencies, but if you're very, very anxious about your work product, that could show up as perfectionism. Now, I would love to have big data because are there associations? Like, do you see certain patterns emerging more? It could very well be, um, but you would need to have just, you know, giant numbers of people and weighing them against, uh, you know, all different aspects of their personality. Um, I asked, a, I did a representative sample I, because questioners always say this. I'm like, 2.8 million people have taken the quiz and this is the percentages. And they're like, but what about selection bias? I'm like, I know about selection bias. So I did a representative sample. Questioner, that's why questioners keep us all honest. So in my representative sample, just for fun, just out of curiosity. So I'm not saying this is just, I just throw this out there for what it's worth. I said, have you ever struggled with addiction? And I didn't say anything about what is addiction? What are you addicted to? And what I found, because many people had proposed to me, why well, obligers might be more likely to be addiction, my rebels, all these things. What I found is that all three, three were the same, but being an upholder tended to make you less likely to say that you had struggled with addiction. And when you think about it, that makes sense. So I could easily imagine that there would be certain kinds of associations that you would see. For instance, obligers often have trouble meeting inner expectations. That might cause them to feel less self-esteem because if I can't keep my promises to myself, that could make me feel bad about myself. Well, that's sort of a natural consequence of being an obliger. Without our accountability, you can, you can keep your promises to yourself. Um, so it's a fascinating question. I just don't have enough data to answer it. And in terms of, obviously, since the book's come out, I'm sure you've heard people unlocking uh, true wisdom, changing habits, making life change based on their tendencies. What have been some of the more exciting stories 
from people identifying their tendency and, and changing? Well, one thing is I've heard about a lot of married couples that are getting along better. Um, I've heard from a lot of like teachers and doctors who feel like they're much better able to communicate um, with the way, you know, with what they say so that they're reaching people in kind of in a way that is allowing them to be heard. But I think of like of all the stories that kind of like, you know, seem most poignant to me. Um, as I said, one of the most difficult combinations is when you have an upholder parent and a rebel child or vice versa. So my sister and I have a podcast called Happier with Gretchen Rubin. And this woman wrote in a question and she said, I'm an upholder. How do I make my five-year-old daughter who's a rebel understand that there are certain things that she just has to do? Like she has to wash her hands after she uses the potty. And I said, look, she doesn't have to wash her hands after she uses the potty. And she's figured that out. So unless you plan on standing next to her in the bathroom for the next, you know, 35 years, you have to convince her that she wants to do that for her own reasons, because of her own identity, because of her own choice, because otherwise as a rebel, you can't make her do that. And so we talked about it on the podcast for a while. Well, the woman wrote back um, after I had talked about identity and talked about choice and all this. And she gave what I thought was the most beautiful example. So she had taken this little girl to visit the mother's grandmother's house. So it was the little girl's great grandmother's house. Very, very elderly, frail woman. And the little girl was running around wild around this old, frail woman. And uh, the mother said, I realized I, I couldn't say to her, you have to stop running. I couldn't say to her, you have to behave. I had to make her decide that that's what she wanted to do. So I said to her, great grandma is so frail. It would be so terrible if she had to go back to the hospital. She needs her protectors. Can you be one of her protectors? And the little girl said, yes, I will be one of her protectors. And she quieted down and she held her great grandmother's hand and she like helped her sit down because it's what she wanted. It's what, who she chose to be. And I thought that moment of transformation, because you can imagine that mother saying, my daughter is a brat. She doesn't listen. She's selfish. She has no consideration for anybody else. The more I tell her to stop running, the more she runs around, not understanding how she is contributing to this dynamic. The more she tells you what to do, the more she's going to resist. Um, but understanding, like, I just need to speak to her in a way that will reach her and allow her to kind of be the kind of person she wants to be. And when she had that choice, that's what she chose. And so I just thought that was very moving because I just felt like that was sort of a sliding door moment where you could, re you could really take it in a completely different direction. I could have absolutely seen myself responding in that other way and not getting that happy result. And has it changed your behaviors in any way, identifying these tendencies? Yes. So I'm married to a questioner. And one of the things about questioners is they often don't like to answer questions. This is very this is a very striking pattern. It's very annoying to all of us who are not pet questioners. I get the irony. Believe me. So anyway, my, my husband's one of these people. And so he, he just needs to know why. So the other day we had this boring bureaucratic forum to fill out. And uh, as a couple, as one does, and I, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and fill this out and get it done. I just want to get it like off of our mutual to-do list. So let me just do it, which is why it's nice to be married to an upholder, right? Because they're the ones that are like, let me just get this done. So I'm filling it out, but he recently switched jobs. So I didn't know his work address. So I called him up and I said, hey, Jamie, what's your work address? And what did he say? Why do you want to know? And I'm just like, why, do, why is everything a conversation? Like, I just want to fill this out. I'm already volunteering my time. It's boring enough already. What does this mean about our relationship that you won't just like answer a simple question? But, now, but that's what I would have thought. But now I'm like, he just needs to know why. If I had said to him, hey, I'm filling out that boring bureaucratic form, what's your work address? He would have told me because it's not that he's a jerk. It's not that he's trying to jerk my chain, which is what I thought for a long time, frankly. Before, I thought he was just trying to like kind of drive me crazy because he thought it was funny. No, I'm like, he's like this with everybody. Not just me. He's like this all the time because he's a questioner. And in many ways, I benefit from it because as an upholder, I'm too likely to do things too readily. And so I'll call him and I'll say, Jamie, do you think I, I should do this? And he's like, why would you do that? I'm like, Good point. Why would I do that? So he saves me a lot of time and energy. Um, I gain from it so much having him be a questioner. Sometimes it drives me crazy. Um, but now I know. And so now when I, I, I'll say to him, uh, what time are we leaving? Because I want to know if I have time to go to the gym. Because then he'll tell me. But like, otherwise he won't tell me. And people are like, your husband literally won't tell you what time you have a brunch reservation. And I'm like, 100% he will not. Because he just doesn't like to answer questions. I, don't, I can't explain it. Other than to say, 
it's a questioner thing. But if I say to him, hey, I need to schedule an interview. What time is brunch? Then he'll tell me. Just needs to know why. I'm just hearing that. My, it's just like, well, th- there, there is many reasons. Like, what is the root of the question? Right? There is like, w- th- there's so many different reasons why you would want to know. And we can't go through them all. And, um, and some seem to me very nefarious. <laughs> so why do we have to play this game? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the thing. Once you see where other people are coming from, you can be like, I get it. You know, I just, I get it. Um, another example. So I'm at a polder and I was working with an obliger. And as an upholder, it's like, I want to do my work in my way. You do your work in your way. I don't want to be your babysitter. Like, why can't we all just like work, do our work? And so um, I would send emails whenever something occurred to me, you know, middle of the night, Christmas day, whatever. Weekends for sure. And she never said anything to me directly, but I heard indirectly that she was feeling very resentful, that she felt like I wasn't respecting work boundaries and she was getting really, really annoyed with me. She was a very valuable coworker, colleague. And so that mattered to me because I, I didn't want her to like be angry. Uh, so what, what do you do? It's like, do we go to HR? Do we have to have a sit down and I convince her that I'm right or she convinces me that she's right? Or we have, you know, how do we decide? And what I realized is I can use delay delivery in Outlook. And so I write an email whenever I want. And 7.30 in the morning on Monday morning, she gets 10 emails from me. So she can do her work in her way and I can do my work in my way. I can respect what she wants and not contribute to her sense of resentment. And I can also work in the way that I like, which is if I have an email on my mind, I just want to get it out. I don't want to have to like keep it on a to-do list or something. Because once I understood that we're, it's not that one of us is right and one of us is wrong and one of us has to convince the other to switch. It's just how do we create an environment that works for both of us? And a lot of times that's a lot easier than trying to argue about who's right and who's wrong. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. We just have different preferences. Yeah, I certainly after reading the book, now understand my fiance's behavior is better, Johnny's behavior is better, <laughs> and, and I'm starting to understand my own motivations better, which is pretty exciting. So you've tackled happiness and habits and tendencies. What are you working on next? I'm so excited about what I'm working on now. It's a book about the body and the senses and about getting to the mind uh, through the body. And so I'm studying the kind of what you would call the five kindergarten senses. And then also sort of some additional senses that I think are like add to our sense of the world. Um, so I'm learning about things like the wonders of ketchup. Turns out ketchup is like uh, the reason that it's so popular is it is like a superfood. Um, but then also things like, you know, very transcendent things like how do we experience time? So it's, it's a subject that is just endlessly fascinating. So I'm really excited to be doing that. I didn't even know there were extra senses. Well, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of, uh, there are all kinds of senses that scientists uh, identify, like your sense of balance and, uh, you know, they all have your sense of, you know, there's things like proprioception, but I'm really taking kind of a more poetic sense of the additional senses and calling it things like time and uh, pattern symbol, things like that. I'm taking a little bit of license with it. Yeah. I'm very excited to, to read it when you're finished. Cause I love sensory cues. Oh yeah. And, and, and I've, I just been obsessed with the idea that throughout civilization and philosophy and religion, that sensory cues have played a large role in society coming together, being built to gather around certain symbols and and having that symbol represent an idea. Uh, It's very fascinating. So that sounds like a blast of research and uh, fun writing. Oh yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really loving it. And we, we thoroughly enjoy the podcast as well. What is the name for our listeners so they can check it out? It's called happier with Gretchen Rubin. And I, I, my co-host is my sister, uh, my sister, the sage. So yeah, we talk every week about how to be happier, healthier, and more productive and more creative. And now is certainly the time for that. So yeah. thank you so much for joining us, Gretchen. It was a blast. Oh, thank you. I so enjoyed the conversation. This week's shout out goes to Nathan Boyer, a recent graduate of our core confidence program. He took the time to write Johnny and I a beautiful story of his transformation since joining the course. And we thought we'd share it with you. 
You see, when Nathan joined us, he was a little socially awkward and reclusive. In fact, some of his anxiety was holding him back from even approaching and talking to people. And after the first four weeks of the course, we focus on rewriting your story, understanding yourself at a deeper level so you can communicate that with strangers and get more comfortable. And he started stretching his comfort zone. At the end of the course, he says he morphed into celebrity class charisma, and he's so excited. In fact, his mindset shifted from a place of scarcity and fear to a speedboat filled with curiosity, adventure, and excitement. He's now leaving base camp at Everest, and he can't wait to start rewriting that story into something that he's proud of. Thank you so much, Nathan, for writing that amazing story and sharing it with us, and we're so proud of you. To learn more about our Core Confidence program and to become another success story, check out theartofcharm.com slash core. That's theartofcharm.com slash core to apply today. Now, if you enjoyed our episode with Gretchen, this week's challenge is right up your alley. This week, we want you to take Gretchen's quiz at quiz.gretchenrubin.com. It's also linked in the show notes. And tell us which of those four tendencies you are. Johnny's the questioner. I'm the obliger. We'd love to hear which category you fall into. As always, you can write us, give us a shout, questions at theartofcharm.com, or find us on social media at The Art of Charm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you enjoy the podcast and you want more specifically of my melodious voice, you can follow me on our social the Art of Charm Insta, Periscope, and YouTube, where I'm live every weekday morning at 8.30 a.m. PSD. We're talking about self-development concepts and having a little bit of psychology humor to start the day. Now, if you're new to the show and you want to learn more about what we teach here at The Art of Charm, listen to our toolbox episodes at theartofcharm.com slash toolbox. That's where you'll get the fundamentals of networking, persuasion, and influence. As always... We have our fantastic free social skills challenge. Don't forget to check that out at theartofcharm.com slash challenge. The challenge is all about improving your networking and connection skills and inspiring those around you to develop a personal and professional relationship with you. It's free, it's unisex, and it's a great way to get the ball rolling. Get some forward momentum. We'll also send you the fundamentals toolbox that we just talked about. This will make you a better connector, a better networker, and a better thinker. Theartofcharm.com slash challenge. Could you do us and the entire Art of Charm team a large favor? Could you go on over to iTunes and rate and review this podcast? It would really mean the world to AJ and I. And if you enjoyed it, share it with your friends. Let them know what you're listening to. The Art of Charm podcast is produced by Michael Harold and Eric Montgomery and engineered by Sam Jay and Bradley Denham at Cast Media Studios. I'm AJ. And I'm Johnny. Have a great week.